my summary slide is um, we are a university institute, it's the Blue Global Health Institute, so uh, unlike uh, Kate, I'm going to be describing really the, the unit, uh, a subunit within Duke. We're reporting to the Provost and the Chancellor of the Health Affairs. Uh, we started operations only end of November 2006. Uh, we have 41 faculty who are members of the institute that's truly part of our governance structure. However, they have their tenure home in six different schools. We did uh, receive authority by the Board of Trustees to appoint non-tenure track faculty, and we have six of them uh, appointed at the Duke Global Health Institute at the moment. We only have 46 staff members compared to the 300 that you have gave. Um, so we're very new, we're still growing. Like your numbers, they're probably outdated as we speak. Uh, and I did that slide yesterday. Um, our scope of operations, the Duke Global Health Institute is not a clearing house. We see ourselves as a catalyst. Uh, maybe even a first point of contact, not even a single point of contact, but a first point of contact. Our hope is that anyone interested in doing global health would come to us at least to let us know they're doing it. We don't pretend to say yes or no and be a clearinghouse. Um, we do private, provide direct funding, uh, offer educational programs, we conduct research, and talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we are starting to provide international technical assistance. We want to do more of that. Um, and Duke, not the Duke Global Health Institute, but Duke has legally registered operations abroad, some sort of legal presence in China, Ecuador, Singapore, Spain, Tanzania, and the UK. And some of those, it, it bears down to just having a bank account that allows us to make some of the payments. Uh, and we're in the process of establishing legal presence in India, Kenya, and Edwards. <coughs> Um, why such a commitment to, the, to global health at Duke? Why another global health something uh, that we needed? Well, like we heard this morning, the student really demanded it. We also have a new generation of interdisciplinary faculty. I don't think that's uh, anything new. And there was also an institutional determination to make a difference, which is the, the title of the current Duke uh, strategic plan. Um, how was glo global health built at Duke? It started um, obviously with university leadership. Uh, we had a um, combination of perfect forces, President, Provost, and Chancellor of Health Affairs considered Global Health quintessential to their portfolio of strategic um, goals, and they all came together. They all coincided, and they asked for a cross-university steering committee to investigate and report to the leadership as to what Duke should be doing in Global Health. Should it be a school? Should it be a program, an initiative? The committee decided that the best was to uh, build a university institute that would report directly to, uh, to the chancellor and to the provost, and it really spans across campus and the medical center. So we do not belong to any school, and that creates uh, huge opportunities and big challenges, as we will see in a moment. There's also been administrative pragmatism. Since we don't belong to any school, who gives us space? Um, who manages our finances? And they decide to split us right in the, in, in the middle, Space com comes from the provost as uh, IT support, uh, and we get our financial and HR management from the School of Medicine. Um, we've worked, it's not been a, a straight process, but we've worked uh, at all the kings, and so, so far it's allowed us to truly work across the whole campus. And what was the context in which EGHI was created? Um, Really, the way Duke was operating is extremely decentralized. I'm sure you can relate to all, all of you to that. Uh, students were seeking international experience, and if they were not getting it through some sort of formal program, like the study abroad program, uh, they would just go on their own. So there was a lot of, uh, obviously, a, a big risk factor. Then faculty members would just pursue their research very much independently, and again, it was hard to track who was where. And the university at the same time was determined to be really a global university. So there were lots of moving forces, and it's in that midst, that chaotic midst, that really the Global Health Institute was created. We uh, do education, research, service, policy, all that at the institute. The policy is still uh, nascent, but we have a very strong educational program. Uh, the number of students involved in some sort of global health educational program has tripled, tripled sorry, in the last three years. We cover from undergraduate courses through a certificate all the way to postdoc programs, and we're actually looking into a doctoral program as well. 
in research, you know, we wanted to support we want to support a broad range of faculty members. We consider ourselves <coughs> interdisciplinary. We're trying to promote inter interdisciplinary working groups. So we are, uh, although we want to support all sorts of faculty, we are um, concentrating our resources, our funding to promote six signature, signature, signature research initiatives, trying to, again to create interdisciplinary teams. In surveys, we um, uh, really trying to cater to that incredible passion that the students are um, uh, exhibiting in terms of creating free work opportunities. We don't want to just give them funding. We want to be sure they've thought about a research question. Do they have the right mentorship? Do they have the right uh, community partner uh, waiting for them? that would really mentor them in making sure that they actually do a favorable impact on the region community. Uh, and we also try to build these international platforms, which I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, for the research of our faculty. As I mentioned, policy is still nascent, but I think we have great potential there. We've heard the urgent need for monitoring evaluation. That's actually where we are doing the most at the moment in policy. And it has to do with basically the funding that we are able to get to do that. We have, uh, obviously, faculty working in many more countries than these. But again, the Duke Global Health Institute, we realize we have a limited um, amount of funding, and we want to try to uh, focus on those funding. So at the moment, we decided to think of our sites as established sites where we have already made a strong commitment. We have a strong collaborator. We always see this as a bilateral, at the very least, bilateral relationship. And we have these established sites in seven different locations. We have lots of other potential sites. Again, we're very new. We're still exploring how we can benefit the local community and the partnership. And that with some of the criteria we're using, uh, we determine you know, which sites receive maybe more funding, more of our resources, and where we can collaborate on submitting grants together. Increasingly, we're trying to have the PIs from the uh, developing country really leading the, the pack and having Duke as a subcontract, for example. What are some of the challenges? So within DGHI, it was really just basically we had to build the institute from scratch, from governance structure, the strategy, the right administrative processes. I think we're over that. It was also building an inter interdisciplinary institute in an environment at Duke where it was very much school to school in collaboration or department to the department. But the moment you put an institute there that, that sort of reports to different people, it was, it was becoming very different, difficult to, to get everyone to think out of the box. Uh, so that was a true challenge. And of course, being in cross campus, so spanning campus and medical center with two very different cultures, and we do see ourselves right in the middle. And then finally, being an international program in a very decentralized university, we'll see a little bit how, how that comes about. As we were experiencing our challenges, so was Duke. Um, and Duke, it was really about building, the question was, they had to build the adequate administrative support functions, finance, HR, legal, which is all taken quite by surprise, not just because the institute was created, but at the very same time, almost uh, by accident, I would say, the Fuqua School of Business was uh, experiencing incredible ex exponential growth in international programs. And so the, but between the two of our, um, initiatives, uh, I think some of the central offices were truly uh, taken by surprise. Um, uh, the, the, the big challenge for Duke is, is, is offering the right size of support, I think. We're struggling with IT, for example. Uh, do, do we want how, how quickly and how much investment do we put in IT? What kind of investment? And those are questions that are still going on right now. Uh, we're really trying to push them to take uh, bold steps, not to be less risk averse, but quite frankly, that is the big question for a big university who wants to globalize is what you do first. Uh, do you first uh, develop the sites and then you follow should with the IT or should you develop first IT uh, at the site where you want to be uh, growing? So those are not easy questions and we're trying to help do uh, answer these by some uh, mutual reinforcing goals. That's really how I see it. Uh, I spend a lot of time with my colleagues in central offices, and it's, it's really great to be at their table, talking to them, telling them what we're experiencing on the field, and then having them take that into consideration. Um, how does Duke address its challenges? Leadership committed is, is, is tre tre tremendously important. Thank you. Um, they, we, we start thinking of an internal organizational structure. Clearly the way Duke was three years ago, which is not sufficient. And it started by 
evaluating different models that already existed. We came to UW and met with Anne and Kate, uh, who generously um, welcomed the delegation from Duke to explain what they were doing. And a lot of what we're doing at Duke at the moment is really based on what was being done here, obviously in a different context of a private university, but still there were a lot of lessons learned for us. Uh, we started some different working groups that conducted gap analysis. So, uh, for example, I was part of the HR subcommittee or working group, and we, looked, we, we were looking at what Duke had in terms of HR policies and how those were sometimes completely in, insufficient or, uh, or not addressing some of the needs. Each one of those working groups uh, made a report that was then escaped to the central office, and it, it, the decision was to create truly an office of global strategy and program, which is at the moment the single point of contact. So this is, for, since a year ago only, Duke has that office that pretend, wants to build the strategy, the international strategy of Duke, and also be that administrative single point of contact, fielding questions, trying to find out, trying to resolve uh, problems. Um, we are hiring third-party providers that's been uh, really part of that Duke strategy, SOS International, High Street, Kelly Services are just some of the names that we're uh, working with at the moment. And the most important part, which is happening as we see, is integrating that global support idea in a different functional area, not creating a, an, a, a, an additional infrastructure to deal with international, but really integrating international into existing functional areas. And to do that, we just received an email recently, literally a week ago, uh, announcing the creation of nine work streams, which I imagine is really to have uh, HR, library services, student services, um, talk about how to, to handle the international um, work of doing. How does the Institute uh, address its challenges? When we truly want to leverage existing resources at Duke. We've tried to collaborate with different units at Duke who, are, who were already doing international work with, before we were even created. Whether it's in the School of Medicine, Nursing, Public Policy, a lot of international work was being do, done at Duke. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So that's been uh, really the way we work. Uh, similarly, we always want to work with a local partner overseas. Uh, we want to focus on just a few sites to start with. We don't want to overstretch. We wish we could be in Latin America. Quite frankly, right now, it's, it's not in our interest. We need to focus on where we do have some leverage and where we have faculty interested in championing the efforts. Um, we want to create information sharing mechanism within DGHI. We're growing so very quickly that within a week, something might happen in the educational uh, group that should be of relevance to the research group. So we meet a lot. We actually really meet a lot. And, and our attitude has been to participate wherever we can, outside, inside of the in meetings, um, to get ideas like today. Um, I'm hoping to really go back to do with lots of very good ideas, but also um, volunteering our, uh, our experiences and making sure that we are a citizen of this effort. So the next step, uh, really what's on my list of things to do, is, is find them do collaborators to jointly build these platforms. Uh, what I mean by platform is really that infrastructure at the international side that will really help the collaboration, bilateral collaboration. I think there's a lot of very high fixed costs like in IT space, maybe even uh, training our local administration in managing grants. Uh, and there's an effort other, on, on, underway, uh, funded by the Fogarty, uh in East Africa to try to do that precisely that, you know, help our partners in Kenya, in Tanzania, you know, handle this immense uh, work that has to do with submitting a federal grant in the United States. And so I think we can do a better job at pooling our resources, hopefully in this room, and, and see if we can work together at these international sites. I think we also need to be careful balancing our academic investment with our um, administrative investment or our platform investment. Make sure that every dollar that we spend on IT, we're not spending on research, and those are really critical strategic decisions. Where, again, where do we spend first? Um, in a limited amount of resources, a, a shrinking pie like we just heard, how do we make those decisions? So those are uh, those are really important. We need to be sure we balance that. And as I said, it's, we we decide that uh, be an active participant of the Duke globalization. Duke has big plans. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think my last slide is this campus in, in China, Duke in Kunshan. Kunshan is a suburb of, of Shanghai. That's the next big agenda for Duke. It's scary. Uh, we're not prepared for this, and we decide to actually be active players because we decide that wherever Duke wants to be. 
if we're at the table talking through the issues, if um, we're a part of the dialogue, then we have a real chance of actually influencing the outcome and hopefully the processes. So thank you very much.